Yes, Madam President and members of the board and Tulsans who are gathered here or watching this meeting. We have a very important uh, presentation tonight and this is one of my very favorite reports to give um, any time of the year. This is our annual State of the District address and this is an opportunity for us to report out on um, our progress and our work uh, for the 2017-2018 school year. Um, this includes the measures that we measured our performance against during the year, including college and career ready graduates, academic excellence, safe, supportive, and joyful school cultures, and organizational health. Um, what I do want you to know, this presentation will probably be about an hour. I know that's a long time, but I also want you to think about, we're condensing a year's worth of really hard work on the part of our teachers and school leaders and everyone on the team into this presentation. We worked really hard to try to make it um, multimedia and interactive and, and, well, I don't know how interactive, but multimedia for sure. Um, so we'll hopefully capture your attention in, in that way. Uh, you can also imagine that a report uh, of this magnitude involves a tremendous amount of work and I don't just mean the whole year of effort on the part of everyone on Team Tulsa to, to, uh, to gain these results, including our students and families, but also in just preparing this information to share with you and our communications team and, and data teams worked really hard to, to pull these um, um, presentations together. I want to give a couple of special shout outs. Um, one is to Marty Casper from our communications team. Um, he really has worked uh, round the clock, especially in the last few days, to, to finish up some of the video presentations that you're seeing here, um, as well as over the last few weeks and capturing some of the stories from different members of our team from across the district. Um, I also want to uh, recognize Janae Day from our team for her work on putting together the annual report um, document, which is not yet available, but will be available and will be released in both English and Spanish um, here in probably about two or three weeks. Um, and so with that, I'm going to turn it over to our Deputy Superintendent, Paula Shannon, who is going to introduce this and we will dive in. Uh, Deputy Superintendent Shannon. Thank you, Dr. Guest, President Schreiber, members of the board. Uh, we're very excited to be here tonight to share with you and with Tulsans our bold journey during school year 17-18 um, that uh, uh, we went on with 3,000 teachers to serve our 40,000 students across our 80 schools, including our, our six uh, charter partners, as well as all of our special facilities. Um, and we did this work together as a team of 7,000 employees. <laughs> We do this work uh, in order to make uh, progress towards achieving our vision to be the destination for extraordinary, extraordinary educators who work with our communities and families to ignite the joy of learning and prepare every student for the greatest success in college and career. We want to inspire and prepare every student to love learning, achieve ambitious goals, and make positive contributions in our world. We know that we have a lot of work to do to improve, um, and we want to share with you this evening the challenges we've faced, the failures we've endured, the lessons we've learned, and most importantly, the both big and small successes that we've achieved together as a team. Here's how this is going to uh, work this evening. Uh, it's a combination of live presentation as well as video. Uh, so we'll start out with an introductory video. Has a lot of the highlights from the year. Uh, you'll find much of this information in our annual report, uh, which you will um, uh, we'll put up on our website in early October. We're working very hard to release that um, uh, so it is translated into Spanish and accessible to many members of our community. Um, we'll also be releasing the videos that you see tonight so we'll be able to access those on our website. So we'll have a video introduction, um, then Sean will actually begin uh, to present each section of our scorecard. So there'll be some video, some data presentation on slides, some more video. Uh, so we'll go back and forth like that uh, and over the course of uh, the next hour, hour and 15 minutes, uh, we'll give you an understanding of the success that we've achieved, where we've fallen short and what we're doing to improve. 
A couple of other final housekeeping things. Uh, as Dr. Gist mentioned, and I mentioned a couple of times, when you go to our website later this week, you'll have access to the full set of data slides that Sean Burke Stresser presents this evening. Um, there'll also be additional data if you're a, a, a data person and you love to dig in. Um, tonight's uh, slide deck is easily 80 slides, so it was kind of hard to print that out. And in the spirit of the environment, we wanted to save some paper. Uh, you will have access to that when you visit our website later this week. As I said, the videos will also be up. Um, and then in early October, we will have our annual report as well as the data pre presentation translated into Spanish. With that, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Sean Berkstresser, who is our Director of Data Strategy. Uh, Sean and our analytics team have spent a lot of time putting together the presentation uh, that you see this evening uh, in close collaboration with many members of our team. Sean. Thank you, Paula. Uh, board President Schreiber, Superintendent Gist, members of the board, thanks for uh, letting me be here. Truly honored to be able to share some of the progress that we're making towards destination excellence tonight. You'll see that um, really trying to condense, like Paula said, lots of information. This is a pretty high level presentation, but we wanted to highlight a lot of the important insights we're learning and also want to again reiterate what Paula stated, which is that we will have even more detailed data available on our website in, in uh, the next few days. So really excited. Sean, can I, I neglected to say one thing that's really important in the interest of pace. We know that you'll have many questions. If you would, as we're engaging, jot those down. Uh, and at the end, we will um, come back and have an opportunity to uh, answer questions. Thank you, Paula. I'll also say that if you get tired of listening to me, we've got videos throughout. So that will hopefully uh, help keep the pace going as well. Um, before we kick it off, do you want us to ground in what we really care about for our students in Tulsa Public Schools? And I'm going to take this straight from Destination Excellence because I think this speaks to this very well. Our students from pre-kindergarten to 12th grade will develop the mindsets, knowledge, skills, and habits to achieve academic, career, and life success. That is our promise to Tulsa and to the students that we serve, the families we serve. And I'm honored to be able to present how we're doing towards that tonight. So to kick us off, I'm going to hand it off to Dr. Gist, digital Dr. Gist, um, to share some initial thoughts and reflections as we uh, kick this off. The 2017-2018 school year was the second year of our journey to become a destination for excellence. We want to be the place where extraordinary educators work with our community and families to ignite the joy of learning and prepare every student for the greatest success in college careers and life. In year two, we focused on four key areas, preparing college and career ready graduates, advancing academic excellence, improving school cultures, and strengthening organizational health. Working with our school leaders and their teams, we developed a district scorecard that set forth targeted outcomes based on the goals set by each school team for their particular learning community and focused on the measures that mattered most to us. Even as we navigated through some unprecedented moments, including a 10-day statewide teacher walkout to address Oklahoma's continued chronic underinvestment in public education, we remained relentlessly focused on the best interests of our students and grounded in our beliefs that our students can, our teachers make it happen, our principals are key, our district is all in, and our community is essential. At Tulsa Public Schools, we believe that every child can learn, every child has talent, and every child has value. We strive to create great educational experiences that are demanding and engaging, structured and joyful, and challenging and supportive. For the third consecutive year, we have seen increases in our graduation rates, with some schools, including McLean, Tulsa Met, and Webster High School, seeing more than 20 percentage point increases. During the 2017-2018 school year, 463 of our secondary students earned nearly 1,400 college credits through concurrent enrollment. And 6,500 career and technology education students earned 2,100 industry
industry certifications. We also increased enrollment in Tulsa Tech's highly competitive programs by 26%, which is 824 students. And that's just academics. Our student athletes brought home six state championships and earned more than $1 million in post-secondary scholarships. Of course, we know that extraordinary teachers are the heart of successful schools. Tulsa teachers are continuously honing their craft and content knowledge to design engaging learning to ensure success in every student. In the 2017-2018 school year, our teachers completed 2,500 professional learning experiences. And during the summer of 2017 alone, 45 teachers participated in the inaugural Tulsa Race Massacre Institute. 1,500 educators participated in teacher-led professional learning at our Summer Ed TPS conference. And our 51 career and technology education teachers were honored with the 2018 Career and Technology Education State Superintendent Award for Excellence. The responsibilities that principals carry are strategic, vast, and intense. As leaders, they must be visible, retain and hire the right staff, cultivate talent, build relationships with families and communities, foster positive and safe school culture, and ensure results. We are committed to supporting their growth as instructional leaders and strengthening the quality of teaching and learning in all classrooms. At the district office, we are continuously working to assess our performance and improve our service to our schools. Our most important role is to ensure that our school teams have the supports, resources, and services that they need so that they can stay focused on what matters most, our students. Our 142 school leaders each completed 112 hours of cross-school professional learning experiences. 26 new principals each participated in 40 hours of learning through the New Principal Academy, a program that includes coaching and development designed to support a smooth transition to the role. This year, our 150 bus drivers transported 7,500 students on 149 routes covering more than 2.5 5 million miles. Our child nutrition team served 2.8 million breakfasts and 4.1 million lunches. And our talent management team received more than 3,300 applications and hired 519 teachers, 26 school leaders, and 406 support staff. High quality schools are vital to the health of our community. And our children and schools need all of us, educators, families, community partners, all of us to support their learning journeys. 120 bike club volunteers worked with 231 students at 19 schools to travel more than 10,000 miles, burning more than 1 million calories. 250 active community partners in education volunteered with and supported 65 of our schools. 1,564 volunteers with reading partners provided 45,698 hours of mentoring and reading support for students at 24 schools. As we continue our journey to destination excellence, we are committed to celebrating and replicating proven models and practices and to embracing innovation as our school teams design and implement new models for learning for our students. All right, tough act to follow, Dr. Gist. So, as Dr. Gist mentioned in the beginning of the video, um, the Destination Excellence Scorecard is really what helps us keep track of all these things that are going on, all these team members across TPS, and really keeps us grounded in what matters most for our students. As we go on throughout the presentation, I'll actually give an overview of each of these four areas in the scorecard, talk about what we're measuring so that we all have a really good understanding of that, and then also talk about how we did last year in 2017-18. I also want to leave lots of time to actually highlight the work that schools are doing, so you'll continue to see those in some of the videos. So before we start, I do want to note that throughout the presentation, you'll, you'll see uh, references to the district goals for some of these measures. And I want to remind us how those district goals came to be, where they came from. So last school year, 2017, 2018, it's the first year in TPS that all of our schools set individual goals for some of these critical measures that then rolled up to create the district goal. So again, when you see a district goal on some, on some slides, 
that comes from what schools set out to accomplish. So we, we combined the school goals to really inform what the district level goal is. So the example at the bottom, say that three different schools are in different places, they have different baselines, and they set different attendance goals. One school set a 91% attendance goal, another set a 95% attendance goal. We combine those together to create the district target. So again, that's what, that's what that means when you see district goal. So to kick us off, the first section of our scorecard is college and career ready graduates. I'm gonna let our Deputy Chief of Academics, Danielle Neves, kick this section off. Between 2014 and 2017, district-wide graduation rates increased 14 percentage points. Schools like McLean, Webster, and Tulsa Met have seen four-year increases of more than 20 percentage points. At some of our schools, the class of 2017 even exceeded the national average. From a businessman's perspective, you can't have community without business, and you can't have successful, resilient business without well-educated employees. We actually will not hire anyone that hasn't graduated from high school. We really lean on Tulsa Public Schools to provide us those uh, responsible employees. We know that earning a high school diploma can change the trajectory of a young person's life. The average annual salary for a person without a high school diploma is under $26,000. With one, it's more than $35,000. Add in a four-year bachelor's degree and the average salary is almost $60,000 a year. There's actually about six and a half million jobs right now that are looking for work-ready, tech-ready, university-ready high school graduates. If you have the appetite to learn, really the world is your oyster, and Tulsa Public Schools provides that forum for you to learn how to learn. College and career readiness is far beyond just academic test scores. It means that our students are ready for whatever they want to pursue in their lives. I didn't really believe that I would be able to get here if it wasn't for the diploma. I just feel ready, I guess. That's, that's kind of the word. I just feel ready for my next um, big thing. And it means that they're prepared to solve the problems of the future, that they have mastery of rigorous content, that they are demonstrating the skills and the dispositions that allow them to grapple with really challenging problems and look for new solutions. I have a friend named David, and he um, he came from Mexico and he did not speak English in like middle school. His passion for learning was really like brought out because of East Central and because of our school. Um, and I really think that that diploma really pushed him to get to where he wanted to be. It does allow him to have these opportunities that like not many kids that are like him have. The world is changing so quickly and what we're finding is that in just a few years, almost all jobs are gonna require some sort of post-secondary education. So we know that we wanna give our students lots of opportunities to start their post-secondary career while they're still in high school. And we believe it's really critically important that students have access to advanced coursework, whether that be through um, advanced placement, international baccalaureate, concurrent enrollment, um, career technical education, so that when they leave us as graduates, they have already started down that road and that path for their careers and college success. Since I had such a head start, it's not going to be as difficult if I would have not had the extra credit that I have. Having all the credit that I have, I am able to double major, and um, that is something that sounds ridiculous. know that implicit bias in our world and our system and day-to-day -day experiences for our students means that some of our students are having more limited opportunities every single day. I think it's important that our students are aware of it and how to deal with it and even how to uh, assess their own biases. What I really appreciated about the Equity Ambassador Program, words create worlds. It means that the things that we say, the things that we hear, create our world that we live in. And so it's our responsibility as the educators and adults in the system to be really active about challenging those biases, about inter interrupting inequities in order to ensure that our students get the best chance at the education that we know that they deserve. If you are looking at the world of your classroom through one set of eyes, 
it's going to leave a lot of people out. My white middle class background uh, is my filter. I see everything through that filter, but what the uh, Equity Ambassador Program allowed me to do was sort of step aside and see it through other lenses. As we work to challenge these biases, one of the things that happens in our classrooms when our teachers are enacting culturally responsive teaching practices is that our students begin to see themselves reflected more in the classroom, in the curriculum, in their learning, and then that learning becomes more relevant for them, and they're able to then bring their selves, their full selves, into their learning. The thing about the Equity Ambassadorship Program was teaching us as we go out into uh, our buildings, back into our buildings, to um, not confront, not to argue, not to debate as much as to have a conversation. All right, so again, first section of the scorecard, college and career ready graduates. Like Danielle said, this really means supporting students to have amazing opportunities after they leave Tulsa Public Schools, regardless of what, what choices they make after they graduate. So there's really two critical components with this section that, that we care a lot about. First is high school graduation, that matters a lot. Second is post-secondary readiness. So how, how ready are people to succeed in college if that's the route that they choose to take? Why does it matter? Danielle talked a lot about why a high school diploma matters, um, not only in earnings potential, but also in, in just the ability to find jobs in the first place. Post-secondary degree is becoming increasingly um, important as well in our society. The 2017 Impact Tulsa uh, Community Impact Report shared this really striking statistic that jumped out to me. So in 1973, 28% of jobs, so about one in four jobs, required some sort of post-secondary credential. By 2020, that's the world that our high school students are entering right now. By 2020, that number will be 65%. So we care a lot about getting our kids through high school so they can access opportunities and preparing them to be able to um, attend post-secondary institutions after that if that's what they want to do. So the way that we measure this, we have three measures in our college and career ready graduate section of the scorecard. First one is graduation rate. So this is a pretty simple measure. How many of our kids graduate within four years of entering high school? Oklahoma's statewide rate, or statewide rate for 2016 graduates was 82%, which is pretty similar to the national average. I'll share in a second about where TPS is. Uh, the second measure in this section of the scorecard is a measure that we take from the SAT. So two years ago, TPS began testing all of our 11th graders during the spring of their 11th grade year. And this gave us a really great understanding for the first time of how all of our students across Tulsa Public Schools were measuring in terms of college readiness. So SAT is one measure, but it does help us understand how likely students are to succeed in college. The measure itself is based on benchmarks set nationally by College Board, which is the company that administers SAT. And essentially these, these uh, Benchmarks are set by what the probability of a student um, succeeding in a freshman level course in reading or math. So we use those same benchmarks that SAT uses. The other measure that we're not ready to report on tonight because honestly we're still really exploring data points in this area and um, diving into national student clearinghouse data is post-secondary enrollment. So again, we care a lot about whether kids are graduating, care about whether they're ready to, to enter post-secondary institutions. This measure helps us understand what are students actually doing after they leave? How are, which institutions are they going into? How many are enrolling? So we look forward to continuing to be able to explore that information in the future. So here's our results for 1718. This document shows where we were in 1516, 1617, and then our results in 1718. We also have two additional columns that you're going to see in some other slides in this presentation. One is the 2017-18 goal. Again, in this case, that's created by combining all of the goals that schools set. 
And on the far right of the screen, we have percent of schools meeting goal. This is the percentage of schools that met their specific individual school goal, not necessarily the district target. So a couple of things I want to call out. One is graduation rate is improving. Graduation rate is an, an asterisk, asterisk um, because it's actually reported a year after the fact. So that 76.9% graduation rate that we see under 1718 is actually how our 2017 seniors um, did. That was our graduation rate for 2017. The second thing I want to call out is that SAT college readiness remained the same. So again, 2016-17 was the first year that we were able to measure this and we had about one in three of our students that took the SAT testing at a level where they met that math benchmark and they met the reading benchmark that College Board set. That was also our result last year in 2017-2018. Sean, before you move on, can I just name one thing? Mm -hmm. When we're looking at the uh, percent of schools meeting their goal, I think it's really, really important to point out that our schools can set incremental, moderate, or aggressive goals. We had many of our school leaders working with their teams across the, the different measures to set aggressive goals. Um, and while they didn't meet those aggressive goals, they did make pretty significant progress. So I just want to, uh, in, a, in a, a shout out to our school leaders who are working very hard uh, to put some context around um, um, what we're uh, sharing with you. Yep. One other thing I want to call out about this slide because I know it's kind of small. We do not have a 2018 graduation rate yet. That's something that we'll receive from the, the state in early 2019. But we do know that over 1,700 class of 2018 students have graduated so far. Last year, we had a total of uh, 1,633 students that graduated. So this is something that we're excited to monitor going forward. So again, about the graduation rate, continues to improve. This slide shows our overall um, TPS graduation rate over the last five years. And that 76.9%, which was the 2017 graduation rate, is actually the highest that it's been in the last five years. This means that, yeah, this means that our students, our students have increasing opportunities after TPS, income potential, jobs, etc. To put this into perspective a little bit, the 14 percentage point increase means that over 250 more students graduated last in 2017 than in 2014. So I think this is something we're really excited about. Hope to continue to, to increase this in the future. Again, 82% is, is the statewide average. That's pretty close to national trends. We want to continue to climb um, to reach and exceed that mark. So graduation rates are increasing. We're closing uh, racial and ethnic gaps in graduation. So a few things want to call out. African American graduation rate, much higher than it was four years ago. American Indian and Alaska Native, and also Hispanic and Latinx. All of these different student subgroups are seeing increasing graduation rates. I'll just pretend you're clapping for me because that kind of feels good, but. <laughs> Definitely don't want to take credit. Our schools are really doing amazing work to try and support students through high school and it's showing. So again, increasing graduation, we're closing gaps. Something we're still seeing though, is that we have to stay relentlessly focused on improving college readiness for all of our students. And specifically, as this slide shows, there's lots of disparities in college readiness by race and ethnicity. So this slide shows in blue the percentage of students for each group that are meeting that College Board math benchmark. Orange is the percentage of students that are meeting the reading benchmark. So you'll see that across all student subgroups, more of our kids are meeting that reading benchmark than math. And then in green, that's the overall, that 33% number that we saw, the 33% of our students meeting math and reading. That's how many of our kids are meeting both of those benchmarks. 
And Sean, I just want to point out the reason that we emphasize the measure of whether or not students are meeting both proficiency in reading and math is because that is a predictor for their success. And so it's important for students to be able to be proficient in both. Yep. So I want to want to say really quickly that these are not deterministic. So just because you're not testing at a certain level, it doesn't mean you're not going on to succeed. But I'll show in a couple slides how these results might factor into like individual students' experiences and, and the challenges a student that's not meeting, meeting these benchmarks might face when they do enter college. So nationally, I think something else that's good about TPS right now is all of our students are taking the SAT across the district. Nationally, not all students do take the SAT, but among those students that do, we see very similar racial and ethnic disparities. This is something that TPS has to continue to stay focused on as we support all of our students. So again, not deterministic, but there are very real challenges for students. So in TPS, just want to call your attention to the bottom left of the screen. Last year, 14% of our African American students were meeting that college readiness threshold where they're proficient in reading and math. They're likely to succeed in those courses when they enter college. 14% of African American students, 57% of our white students were meeting those benchmarks. So they're very real discrepancies that we're continuing to learn about and act on. So let's, let's talk a, about what these benchmarks mean in practice for real students. Again, SAT scores are not a certain indicator of college success, but they help us understand what types of challenges students might face once they enter college. So let's meet two college freshmen. First one is Bianca. Let's say that Bianca is college ready. She might enter school, maybe she goes to OU, maybe she goes to OSU. She might have the opportunity to actually test out of some initial college courses. Maybe she doesn't have to take an entry level math course or reading course. That means she doesn't have to pay for those, she doesn't have to have the extra time taking those courses. Right off the bat, she's getting some advantages right there because she is college ready. Maybe she has the ability, because she's ahead of some of her peers, to work part-time as a tutor. She might have some extra time to play intramural sports and, and create lots of relationships and connections across campus. Somebody like Bianca that has this type of experience is more likely to persist into their second year of college. Let's also talk about Sarah. So let's say that Sarah is a student that graduated the same year as Bianca. Sarah is not college ready. She's one of those, those students that's not meeting the math and, and reading benchmarks. When Sarah enters school, she's likely going to need to take additional remedial courses right off the bat to catch up. She might also need to spend time multiple nights a week in tutoring sessions. Maybe somebody like Bianca is actually helping Sarah along the way. Sarah might feel pressure to study more. She might be struggling. She might have less, less time for social activities. Somebody like Sarah that enters college a little bit behind is less likely to persist into their second year. Doesn't mean that Sarah is not going to achieve. It does mean that Sarah is going to have more challenges and likely need additional supports. This is why we care so much about something like college readiness. We're wanting all of our students to be able to have a positive experience and, and make a successful choice for themselves after they leave Tulsa. All right, so we have some bright spots. We have some schools that are doing amazing work to continue to support students, both in graduating and in preparing um, their plans for the future. So really excited to highlight a couple of those schools. So the first one is Webster High School, and you're gonna learn more from their principal, Shelly Holman, about some of the things that they, they're doing.
culture over the past five years, and we'd like to think that um, we've moved forward by leaps and bounds. The key to our success is that we're able to meet and know all of our students individually. Uh, we definitely study each student with an EWI system, an early warning indicator system. We look at students' uh, attendance behavior and coursework. We know that those three elements are what actually move students forward to be successful. And we look at those students individually in the administration team meetings. Uh, our counselors take a hard look at each student, work with them, and then our teachers are, are well informed about each student and their progress. AP is new for us over the past five years. It's um, extremely high this year for us. We have six courses, which is high for Webster High School. We'll observe them for several weeks through the term. I'll um, ask them to come in and talk with me, and I'll say, hey, I'm teaching this AP class, and you really uh, would do great in there. We push kids into those rigorous classes because we know that's going to make them college and career ready. We have more students that know about college. We have more students that are applying to college. We make students aware of opportunities via um, college reps here, or we have senior forums. Whether it be a trade through tech, or um, something they just need a certification for, or the college route, we push that continually. So by the time they, they get into 10th, 11th grade, they've had that. Um, you know, that, hey, we have to do something in our life to be productive citizens. And um, so they're just used to it. We just make sure that the word is out, that all students can attend college. We can get them there through the OLAP process starting in eighth grade, or we can get them there through filling out a FAFSA. And then Nikki Dennis, who's the principal at Rogers High School. College Summit is a required class that takes the concept of advisory. We take that notion that kids need to be building a relationship with teachers, and then we create a curriculum around that concept. It's not just talking about it, it's the experience and then the building the relationship, relationships with these students that works. I just think it's the work that we've done in the 9th, 10th, and 11th grade that gets kids to see that that's a viable option. At Rogers, at the freshman and sophomore level, they are only taking pre-AP courses, and so it becomes the norm. And they, they accept that. By the time your kid's a junior, we only offer AP classes. That is what we offer. The expectation is that by the time they're a junior, they have the option of either the AP track or if their PSAT scores show that they're ready for college level, we want them to hop right into Composition 1. A lot of kids think they want to go to college, but they don't know, understand the path. They don't know how to get there. We're helping students find their core talents or their, or their core interests, and then providing them the tools, the path to reach that goal. All right, so the second section of our scorecard is academic excellence. We need to measure in Tulsa Public Schools student progress throughout their time in TPS, not just when they're getting to high school and getting close to graduation. So I'm gonna hand this off to Devin Fletcher, our Chief Learning and Talent Officer, to talk about what this work looks like.
road to graduation and college career readiness starts on the first day of pre-kindergarten. If we are doubling down on building strong academic foundations in the elementary grades with a relentless focus on literacy and numeracy through powerful instruction using high quality engaging curricula and instructional materials. We believe that every student should have access to a wide range of texts that support knowledge and vocabulary building in a variety of subjects. These texts are rich, interesting, and engaging that become increasingly more rigorous as students become more proficient readers. We believe that mastery of foundational reading skills is an imperative step in learning to read. Foundational reading skills must be explicitly taught and thoughtfully practiced. We believe that an effective language arts classroom prepares students to read, write, speak, and listen with a critical and analytical mind. We believe that administrative and community support is necessary to ensure that all students and teachers are provided with effective learning opportunities. is not just reading a text, being able to, to be fluent. It's also understanding. We are asking students more and more now at a much younger level to interact with the text. That means making inferences. What do you think will happen? Why do you think that will happen? And being able to take things out of the text and maybe even connections with their own lives, you know, asking them more questions and getting them to think on a much higher level and I guess pushing them to do more than what they ever thought they could. When we first started teaching kindergarten, we were happy if the kids could count to 20. But now we're really going, not just the surface level, we'd like them to understand what 5 to 10 is. Learning um, the different parts that make up a fight, decomposing it and putting it back together. But there's a deeper level of understanding we want to build. In kindergarten, we often work together because it is the first time they're doing some of that. And it's great to see um, that they start to be able to track the, where the problems are, um, how to solve those problems, and get it down on paper. My kids show great growth. Plus, it's not just always the data, the data, the data. It's what I see with the kids. They see that math is an active learning um, part of our day, and they're excited about it. That when they figure something new out, they find ways to solve problems. So talking about what you're learning, verbalizing it is a big part of Eureka. It becomes something that in their adult life they need to do, they need to problem solve, they need to work with other people, and that is also a part of our math. We know that exceptional instruction is the foundation for a child's academic success and that strong, caring relationships are essential to creating great learning experiences. So as we work to raise the academic bar for our students, we must support our educators in growing and improving their teaching practices. Our schools are the unit of change. It is what happens in our classrooms from day to day that will eventually transform teaching and learning across the district. One of the ways that we focused on advancing academic excellence was through innovation and continuous improvement at our pilot school. In 2017-2018, school leaders, teachers, and content teams at 14 schools across the district designed, tested, measured, and adapted new learning models. These schools instituted best practices in key areas such as building a culture of learning and feedback, enhancing educator content expertise, and integrating social-emotional learning competencies into day-to-day -day instruction. With this intentional school-led learning, we can begin to understand what it takes to create and sustain the conditions and supports that teachers need to transform teaching and learning in our district. All right, so striving for academic excellence means measuring what matters for our students and identifying and addressing areas that we need to improve. We use an assessment called the NWEA MAP assessment, and the reason we use that First and foremost is because it gives us really great information about students. It tells us what students are ready to learn. This in turn gives teachers information that they can use to inform instruction. MAP also lets us uh, benchmark ourselves against national peers. It's given three times a year, so we get regular information. And beginning in 2017-18, we offered MAP at all schools across the district, grades K through 10. So this, this is the primary assessment that we use to measure the academic excellence part of the scorecard. Before I talk about the actual measures, I want to briefly touch on 
proficiency and growth. You're going to hear those terms. So I just want to talk about what those mean, what we mean when we say them. Proficiency, we consider a student proficient if they're scoring as good or better than at least half of their national peers at the same grade level. So because we have MAP, we're able to, to determine this. So a quick example, say that we have a student named Carlos that's scoring at a 200. That's his reading score when he starts fourth grade. If the average student in fourth grade has a 195 reading score, Carlos is considered proficient. He's above that. So that's proficiency. Growth. This is based on our best estimate of the typical growth for students that are in the same grade with the same starting score. So let's again, let's take Carlos. Carlos is starting fourth grade. He has a 200 reading score. Let's say that one of Carlos's classmates is named Sam. He has a 200 as well. The average fourth grader who start the year with a 200 grew by eight points during the school year. Let's say that that's the case. Carlos grows by 10 points during the, the school year. Sam grows by four. So both of these students grew. They're both learning. But Carlos met and exceeded his growth. He had 10, 10 points of growth. The average student had eight. Sam still grew by four points, but he did not meet his projected growth. That means he's falling behind his peers. So that's what growth means. When we see a growth percentage, it doesn't mean students aren't learning. It's telling us how much are they learning compared to their peers. So our actual scorecard measures. The first one is the percentage of third graders that are proficient in reading. Third grade is a very critical milestone in a student's career, and we want to make sure that our students are reading at, a, at, a, at least at grade level by the time they're in third grade. So that's the first measure. Second measure is the percentage of students that are proficient in both reading and math. So remember when we talked about this college readiness uh, score that we use, they had to be proficient in reading and math. We use math the same way so that we can keep track of our students and understand um, how they're making progress. Like Dr. Gist said earlier, excelling in both of these subjects is really an important predictor of future academic success. We also have two growth measures that are on the scorecard. Percentage of students that meet their projected reading growth and the percent that meet their projected math growth. Something to call out really quickly is that nationally 50% of kids meet their projected growth. What this means is that if we have schools where more than 50% of students are meeting their growth, it means that they're outperforming national peers. They're, they're closing gaps. They're getting their students to grow at levels more than students across the country. So that 50% number is really kind of the magic number that lets us know whether we're moving as much as we need to be moving to catch up to our, to our national peers. So here's our results for the last school year. A few things to call out. One, this is the first year, 2017-2018, first year that we were able to test all students grades K through 10. The prior two years, we actually only were able to test students grades kindergarten through third. So some of these measures aren't quite comparable, but we still wanted to put them on the scorecard so we can keep track of how, we're, how we've done. So third grade proficiency, we went down to 34% of our third graders meeting proficiency in third grade. So that means 34% are at or above that the middle level for students across the country. 26% of our students are proficient in reading and math. 43% of our students met their projected reading growth. And 47% met their projected math growth. I also want to call out that some of our targets this year are 2017-18 goals for projected growth in reading and math. We're really aggressive, but you see the 56%, 55%. TPS needs to get to that level in the future for us to be able to continue to increase proficiency for our students. More of our students are proficient in reading than math. So reading is the orange bar on this chart. Math is blue. You'll see that 26% that summary proficiency measure that I shared on the last slide is made up 
have these two measures. So 33% of kids are proficient in math, 39% proficient in reading, and 26%, that green line, are proficient in both of those subjects. Even though more kids are proficient in reading, last year more of our students met their projected growth in math. 47% of our kids met projected math growth. That's getting us closer to that 50% national benchmark that we want to be at and above. Something to call out on the bottom is that you'll see that a lot more of our, sec of our secondary schools met their projected math growth than elementary schools for reading really struggled across the board and are continuing to focus a lot on um, achieving more reading growth for our students. I want to call out a few more things. We have to ensure that more of our students from all backgrounds are meeting and exceeding growth. Again, that's, that's a really critical measure to let us know how students are progressing. Last school year, students of color were less likely to meet their projected reading and math growth than white students. And English language learners, economically disadvantaged students, and students with disabilities all had fewer students meeting growth than their counterparts. Something we're continuing to focus on. I want to give an example, though, of what it looks like when our schools change the trajectory of our students' lives. So let's look at some current first graders who were kindergartners at Anderson Elementary last year. Anderson is a high poverty school, traditionally low performing, lots of students of color. They had students that came into the year last year that were not proficient. They weren't, they didn't have the same basic reading skills that lots of other students across the country had. So in fact, 32% of their kindergartners last year entered the year below proficiency in reading. This means that about two thirds of these students began kindergarten behind. So they have, think about that, they haven't even started their, their educational careers and they're already behind compared to national peers. But during the school year, 97% of Anderson's kindergarten students met or exceeded their projected reading growth. And what that means is that by the spring, by the end of the school year, 83% of those students were proficient in reading. So to put this into plain terms, although the majority of these students began kindergarten behind, most of them were actually caught up by the end of the school year compared to their national peers. Our schools are doing this and there's examples like this. This is what we're really striving for as a system. So I really wanted to highlight the great work that Anderson's doing there. All right, and now to highlight a few more schools that are really committing to best serve all of their students and, and give you insight into what some of these schools are doing. McLean Junior and Senior High School, McClure Elementary, and Perry Elementary. So we've got some videos to highlight these schools. actually changed about how to reach high standards and so it's pushing other departments to do that same thing. I think it has a lot of added benefits. I think first and foremost it's what's best for kids. So the beauty about it is if, if you're struggling with something as a math teacher you have someone that you can work with. Having those conversations with other teachers and troubleshooting issues in the classroom or I tried to teach this thing and nobody got it. Can somebody else tell me a way I could approach it differently? The tone here is that academics is number one, but also uh, there's no cop out. If you didn't get it, you're still gonna get it. The program uses both of their map data and then it also administers a diagnostic exam at the beginning of the year and it uses those two exams to calibrate their curriculum for the rest of the year. So it's able to identify the gaps that they have that they need in order to reach the skills that are on their level. So instead of moving these 10 kids who maybe are on grade level and making sure that they get to continue to progress and leaving everybody else behind, the program is 
able to identify the needs of every individual student and give them content that they're ready to see and that they need to see so that they can keep moving forward. They have ownership. And that's what we're, we want our kids to have. But we also want them to also take that and put that in other classrooms. So that was Principal John Williams at McLean. This is Katie Jimenez, the principal at McClure Elementary. We realized that our kids needed more, um, more than just academics. They needed a foundation, a developmental foundation, to be able to understand and regulate their emotions. I would say behaviors and student emotions have changed a lot in my 21 years in the district. So there was an opportunity to participate in a pilot and it was through the Wallace Foundation. So we um, would love, we said we would love to be part of that and our school was selected. With social emotional learning, it helps students recognize their emotions, give them some strategies to help regulate, to get them back in their classroom or stay in the classroom. Students or adults will create a charter together saying how they want to feel at school and they identify the actions they'll take to make sure they're feeling that way and then what they'll do when we're not feeling that way. So it's an agreement um, to support our feelings at school and the way we're feeling. We have a mood meter. Um, the mood meter gives students an opportunity to um, indicate how they're feeling at any given moment. There are four quadrants of the mood meter. They're not responsible for pinpointing and using a specific word to say how they feel, but they will um, they'll, they'll plot it on the mood meter. So teachers are using the mood meter with students in the morning. Um, as students rotate to other teachers throughout the day, oftentimes those teachers will reconnect and say, let's replot how we're feeling. It gives the teacher a snapshot of where kiddos are emotionally before they start teaching. I just think there's a lot of kids that can't regulate themselves and with the, just identifying where they're at on the mood meter helps them go, wow, I'm in the red and this is why. We are investing deeply in a practice that takes time. Social emotional learning is something that it would be very easy to say we don't have time for that. But I think us putting a stake in the ground and saying if we don't do this, we won't be able to do anything else successfully. I think that is a saying like school has to change. What school means has to change. It can't just be about academics. We're really caring for the whole child. And then the last video for this section is Principal Tessa Cross at Perry Elementary. We really need equity for all students that everyone have the same experience and the same like even down to the curriculum, having being exposed to the same curriculum, but also the same experience in their educational journey, and so that they are current college and career ready. I want to build leadership in my building, not just for my team leaders, but for everyone. And to see my teach my team leaders really getting nitty gritty with my teachers and leading them and equity and just talking about, you know, how can we make our curriculum here we math and see how like equitable for all of our kids and just them talking and leading those discussions, it was amazing. I think they're they're finding their niche and their group and actually are becoming a team leader. With the leading educators whole content cycle piece, it's really written out for us. It's really directed. So we have an agenda, it's really a focus. And during those focuses, it's time for self-reflection. There's a time, and I wouldn't say a survey, but there is a time to discuss if we need to change, change it up, don't change, what's going great, what's not going good. It's building teams within our group, our grade levels, and so I feel like it's helping each team be closer. Yeah, I think that teachers have more involvement in the decision making and in their curriculum, being able to really understand and pick and pick the right topic for the students at, that they have at that point. And building that capacity for teachers in the building to become great leaders for other teachers in the building. I really like that we collaborated with other large districts from other states. We really talked about how will this help improve our school. And when I say school, I'm talking, you know, our 
community, the culture, the climate, our classrooms, the instruction. We're going to dive deep into the curriculum. And I think that this time with the teacher leaders and our, their teams, it's really going to help them self-reflect, looking at that data, looking at scholars, like really what is it that maybe this group of scholars needs or this, and how can I change my instructional practice to better serve my kids. All right, so the third section of the district scorecard is safe, supportive, and joyful school climate and culture. This is how students feel at their schools. And we know this is also really critical to support students in their academic journeys. So I'm gonna let Ebony Johnson, our Executive Director of Student and Family Support Services, introduce this part of the scorecard. looked at discipline um, in, in a way of like when students do things then there's a consequence and now we're doing more of a research approach to what caused the behavior what are some of the outside factors that's affecting that child's behavior how have we incorporated strategies and methodologies to support a change in behavior and then how do we then give them a second and third chance to get it right we know that there are three factors that are really important for students to thrive feeling a sense of belonging feeling safe and having strong relationships with caring adults. It's not hard to figure out that when students feel a sense of belonging, when they have relationships that are built, um, and then they feel safe, then we know that that means that attendance will increase, chronic absenteeism will decrease, and students' behavior will be better. It is so very important that we have adults who understand the importance of care for students all through the day. Tens of thousands of students reside in Tulsa Public Schools. It's very important that we are intentional about getting to know our students. In Tulsa, the legacy of the Greenwood Massacre still affects our young people of color, particularly our black students. And those disparities carry over into the experiences our black students have with out-of-school suspensions. So we are all charged with building relationships with them, finding out what their career goals are, figuring out a way to foster those at the secondary level, at the elementary level, exposing them to opportunities and making sure that we set examples for them so that they know what their interests could be. We actually have data that speaks to um, the strong areas of a school with culture climate and then the areas of concern and so one to pay attention to what the data is stating regarding students um, sentiment and how they feel in order to really dig down and, and get to the issues and then two making sure that that adults are getting around in the building to get to know each student learn them by name shake their hands ask them a few questions about how it's going with school and with life we also must reserve the use of exclusionary practices for only the most extreme cases. Removing a child from a school setting cannot be taken lightly. So it's important that when we do it, it is only in cases where it is the only appropriate option. Many of our school leaders are taking an innovative approach on how they are handling disciplinary issues with our students. Many of our schools are incorporating rooms that allow for mindfulness. They are incorporating some um, abilities for students to manage their emotions. And so it is critical that we take relationship building serious because relationship building fosters the safety that we're looking for. It fosters the belonging. All right, so to kick this off and talk about why this matters, just really briefly, I want everybody to think about the best team or family that you've ever been a part of and just reflect for a second on what it felt like to be part of that. And that's why this is so important for our students. Destination Excellence talks about what we mean when we talk about school culture. Students, teachers, and leaders working with families and community partners will foster safe, supportive, and joyful learning environments that emphasize acceptance and inclusion for all students in all schools. So when we talk about school culture, another way we can think about it is like the personality of the school. What does it feel like to be part of that for our students, for our teachers, for our support staff? So the way that we measure this 
It's made up of several different items. First one is percentage of students with positive perceptions of belonging, school safety, and teacher-student relationships. Dr. Johnson, Johnson talked about all of those in the video. We launched a new survey last school year that allows us to understand some of our students' perceptions in these areas. How safe do they feel? Do they feel a sense of belonging? This is very new information for the field of, of K-12 education, and we're learning alongside other districts how to best use this information in a responsible way. But we will be able to use this type of information to measure this moving forward. We also measure attendance rate. Dr. Johnson talked about this. Attendance is critical. It lets us know how often students are coming to school. Attendance influences other important outcomes such as academics and also graduation and dropouts. Chronic absenteeism rate is related to attendance, but this is another measure we use. This lets us know how many of our students are missing a significant portion of the school year. So a student's classified as chronically absent if they miss 10% or more of, this, of school days that they're enrolled. Across the country, 8 million students were chronically absent in 2015-16. Children living in poverty are two to three times more likely to be chronically absent. So this is a very critical measure for Tulsa Public Schools. Suspension rate is also an indicator of, of school climate. This is pretty simple. This is the percentage of students that are suspended. Out of, they have an out of school suspension at least once during the school year. Out of school suspensions are one of the primary indicators of dropping out of school. Something that we're really focused on and schools are doing great work in this area. Here are results from 2017-18. Again, I mentioned the, the uh, percentage of students feeling like safe, sense of belonging, positive relationships, something that we'll be able to report a baseline in the future. Average daily attendance rate was 91.9% last year. That was a decrease from 2016-17. We also saw a higher number of students or a higher percentage of students who are chronically absent. So that was 28%. That's over one in four students across Tulsa Public Schools. Our suspension rate decreased to 7.4% but we didn't meet our 17-18 goal because we set very aggressive goals as a district. So we, we still decreased, but we didn't meet our target there. I'm gonna go over each of these really quickly. Most of our schools had lower attendance than the previous school year. And as a district, you'll see that our, our elementary, middle, and high schools all saw decreased attendance rates from the prior year. Elementary schools in particular, though, dropped by over one percentage point from 2015-16. So it's something that we're definitely keeping an eye on. Chronic absenteeism rate, so again, this is telling us how many of students are missing a lot of school. This rate increased, so this also got worse. And in particular, elementary school students were a lot higher than they were two years ago. And across the district, again, 28% of our, of our students were chronically absent. Suspension rates, remember a couple slides ago on the scorecard, it showed us that suspension rates have decreased for multiple years. But you'll notice that middle school in particular still has a, a higher suspension rate than other grade levels. So 14.8% of middle school students were suspended and we had fewer schools meet their suspension goals for middle school than the other grade levels. So despite the drop in suspensions, I do want to call out that we had very large disparities between different students. African American students continue to be suspended more than students of other races and ethnicities. Looking at suspension rates lets us compare in a consistent way how often students are being suspended regardless of the size of the student body. And for African Americans, nearly one in seven students was suspended at some point last school year. This is why it's imperative that we continue to focus on student climate and engagement when addressing suspensions. Dr. Johnson talked about how we use exclusionary practices or taking students out of school, removing them 
only when we need to because we know how critical it is to, to have students learning. You'll also learn more in a few minutes about some of the ways that our schools are trying to create equitable school climates for all students. For attendance, we're leveraging the power of data to much better understand how we can support students and families to encourage coming to school more often. So we have new insights that I want to share with you. One is that secondary students, so middle and high school students, have the highest rates of chronic absenteeism. So we know that we, we can divert resources to that, that part of the district. Cold weather affects elementary students the most. So in fact, on freezing temperature days, we can actually expect a decrease in attendance rate of two to three percentage points. That means nearly 1,000 fewer students on a day that's freezing. We also know that students are less likely to attend school dur during a short week. So let's say that there was a holiday on Monday, professional development day on Tuesday. Students are actually less likely to attend school the rest of that week. So we're partnering with several departments to uh, use some of these insights to inform the 2019-2020 school calendar. We're also working with Attendance Works, which is an organization that's supporting us in understanding our attendance data and also helping our schools and community develop comprehensive strategies and supports to support families in getting students to school. I do want to close with this by saying that these are not immovable measures. Last year, there were nearly 1,000 students that were one day away from not being chronically absent. Our schools are working very hard and have the ability to improve in these areas and support students. So something we're excited about. I want to highlight a couple bright spots in this area. East Central Junior High and Springdale Elementary. Both of these schools are really doing innovative work to support inclusive, equitable school cultures for all of their students. So Principal Josh Regner at East Central Junior High. I think the students feel like um, they have a sense of this is where I belong and these are my people. Like this is who I move with, this is my class, this is my group. We already had the time to collaborate so I was more interested in creating a structure around the collaboration. And that's where we came with um, the pod system. I think really when we started the pods and actually started um, putting core teachers together with a set of students, that was the first big shift. And the thing that that did is it began to build culture within our school because now the teachers could talk, like the math teacher could talk to the science teacher and say, I'm seeing this, are you seeing this kind of issue? And could come, how can we work on that? How can we fix that? So that was our first step. And one of the things that we discussed on the daily is how things went in class, how the teachers were, you know, somebody else caused a ruckus, how did the teacher handle it? Oh, really? How did you feel when the teacher handled it? I really think the pods do empower us as educators to meet the needs of our students. Whatever Josh is doing, however he's talking to the teachers, whatever relationships they're forming and building, whatever workshops they're doing together, whatever videos they're watching, my suggestion is, is that everybody take a look at what they're doing and how they're making changes. The first thing I did was listen. Um, I didn't come in with my own agenda. It was really listening to the teachers. It gave me another tool to use. Um, definitely um, did feel more empowered in that um, it also allowed me to get to know my students better. I know that sounds odd, but I was able to see my student in a different lens. And I've never felt safer in letting somebody else be around my kids or helping them grow as what Josh has created at East Central Junior High. He makes it feel more like family environment and not, I'm here to teach your kid how to take a test. When we hire people, we hire people that are gonna fit in our culture first. We believe like the instructional side of things can be taught, um, but we want people that are gonna fit in our culture and believe in our kids and believe in our community. And then Rebecca Bacon and her staff at Springdale Elementary. We 
believe in building life altering relationships here at Springdale. The teachers are all in. They, they build relationships with families. I like to say that I build the relationships with the families. I'm here every morning at 7.15 and I'm usually either outside or in the hallways greeting every family. Most of the times I can identify the parents to the child or I am on a first name basis with the families at this point. I've been very intentional in my hiring. Um, at last count, I have 14 bilingual staff. We have a dual language program. So we are able to meet parents' needs. And we have that jokingly relationship with the families and I can say, hey, where's the doctor's note? And they're like, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot it, I'll bring it back. Um, and so I think that that's what's really great about our school is that we're at that point in our relationships with our families, that we no longer have that tense moment where you have to, where the parent feels accused because you're asking them for a doctor's note. Those kind of things that keep kids in school um, really um, are huge and having that staff that's able to communicate that to them it just really makes the difference. Take the time to leave your office. Take the time to leave your space, go out, meet the families, whether it be after school or whether it be before school. We do home visits twice a year. Um, just really, it's a pleasant uh, house call. We say hello, glad your child's in my class. Is there anything we can do to work with you? Why are our students that are chronically absent? What's going on? What do they need? And um, my, my team reaches out to the families and sees if it's something that we can assist them with. And then we're almost there. The last section of the scorecard is organizational health. So the first three sections are all about our students. How are they doing? This section is really about the health of our workforce and the adults that are serving our students and families. So I'll let Deputy Superintendent Paula Shannon kick this section off. With 7,000 employees, we are Tulsa County's third largest employer, but we also want to be Tulsa County's best employer. And that means creating an organizational culture where our team members feel supported, connected, and valued. At Tulsa Public Schools, the heart and soul of our work is to ensure every student develops the mindsets, knowledge, skills, and habits to achieve academic, career, and life success. And a healthy and strong organizational culture keeps team members aligned and connected, whether they are in classrooms, driving buses, managing teams or serving meals. Tulsa Public Schools should be a place where people want to work and where they share that joy and enthusiasm with their friends, family, and community. When all 7,000 of us feel that intense and meaningful connection to each other and our students and their families, we'll be able to set a new standard for what's possible in our schools. As a learning organization, we have an unwavering commitment to continuous improvement, which means that we need to understand what's working, what isn't, and how we can adapt, adjust, and continue striving to create the kinds of exceptional working experiences and conditions our team members deserve. We're focusing on three key areas to understand the health of our district. Novice teacher retention, employee engagement, and district office service. Our district office teams exist only to serve our schools. And we are continuing to design our district office teams to be adaptive and responsive to our school's particular needs. We're working to understand how well our district office team is serving our school leaders, teachers, and schools by asking about employee perceptions in three key areas. District office personnel are empathetic toward my concerns or issues. District office personnel attempt to fully understand my concerns or issues. And it's clear that the district office cares about the welfare of teachers and students. While we've made some improvements, we're continuing to seek feedback from our team. And we're using those insights to guide our work as we move forward. Feedback from our teachers and school leaders has already led to some important operational changes. District days of service at schools, improved team onboarding experiences, removal of school click charges for copies. And we're still listening. One of our habits of success is to welcome criticism and leverage that feedback to help us improve and grow. And we look forward to supporting and serving our team over the coming year. Shannon talked about it, we want to be the best employer in Tulsa Public Schools. That means going against some pretty um, top-notch competition. So think about somebody like Quick Trip. They focus intensely on their employees and it really shows. 
we at Tulsa Public Schools also want to be like this and, and want to be a place where employees thrive, they grow, they develop, they, they want to make a career here. Talented, motivated, and happy employees are really the heart of what we do in Tulsa Public Schools. This is something that we care a lot about. So what are our scorecard measures? First one is novice teacher retention rate. Everybody knows the field of teaching is changing. More and more alternatively certified teachers are entering the profession. People are coming from alternate pathways. Improving our support to novice teachers is critical for student success and for encouraging healthy workforce moving forward. So that's one measure. How many of our first and second year TPS teachers are staying? We also measure employee engagement. We feel that understanding how our employees perceive their jobs, their um, satisfaction, their commitment, all of that helps us identify ways to better support their growth and development and get TPS closer and closer to being that destination for extraordinary educators. And then the last measure in this section is the percentage of teachers and principals that have positive perceptions of district office service. Our school teams make it happen and district office is here to support them. That's why we exist. So this is also another measure that we keep track of. Here are our results. So for novice teacher retention, we're actually really excited because over three out of four novice teachers stayed into TPS this school year. It's a market increase from last year when our retention rate was 68%. Something we're very happy about. We also, for the first time, launched an employee engagement survey. So I'll show you in a couple slides what those questions were. So this was our baseline, but we found that 86% of our employees across different um, personnel groups are engaged and committed to Tulsa Public Schools. So that's kind of our baseline moving forward. Last measure is the percentage of teachers and principals with positive perceptions of district office service. So again, I'll go into more detail on this in a couple slides. This is a question from the OU Culture and Climate Survey that lets us know how many of our teachers and principals are saying agree or strongly agree on a six point scale about how they agree with a statement about district office service. So we'll go into that in a second. We decreased in that measure. So 21% was our, was our score for this past school year. So again, starting at the top, teacher retention improved. We're investing a lot in our, in our new high, newly hired teachers. We want them to feel supported. We want them to be excited to be part of Tulsa Public Schools. And this is a metric that we want to continue to increase moving forward. I do want to point out, though, that we retain nearly 70 more novice teachers than we did the year prior. So something that we're excited about. We know part of retention is how somebody feels with the organization. How connected are they? In spring, we surveyed many of our employees to better understand their perceptions and experiences. So we surveyed staff from district office, school leaders, and teachers. And as you can see in this chart, had lots of responses. We got a lot of information back from our employees. I want to highlight that we had almost 2,200 teachers respond to these questions, which I think represents just the, the hunger that, that teachers have to provide us feedback. And we're excited to act on that. Our results indicate that most staff members across all of these groups are engaged and committed to TPS, but there's very clear opportunities to improve. So remember that 86% overall average that I shared a couple slides ago on the district scorecard? That's made up of the average of these questions for teachers, school leaders, and district office. So for the question, I have a good understanding of the mission and goals of Tulsa Public Schools. See pretty high percentages there. Teachers, 86%. School leaders, 98%. District office, 96%. Another question, I'm highly committed to Tulsa Public Schools. And then the last one, I would recommend Tulsa Public Schools to my family and or friends as a place to work. This is something that you can see teachers 
are responding less favorably than other employee groups in that question. So something that we can keep track of. Based on national benchmarks, our level of commitment in Tulsa Public Schools is likely at or above average. So remember, lots of these questions we're seeing in the 80%, upper 80% for some. So a large study that came out last year that tried to compile this type of information from other organizations and other industries. And I wanna just highlight, I intend to be still working for the company in a year's time. That was a question that was asked across all of these other companies. 84% responded favorably to that question. We have a question that says, I'm highly committed to Tulsa Public Schools. 86% of teachers, 91% of school leaders, 88% of district office. I feel like we're likely above some of these national benchmarks, but this is our starting point. And now that we have it, we can continue to improve. A few years ago, we also started looking very closely at the perception of district office. So that's the last measure on our scorecard in this, in this category. On the annual OU Culture and Climate Survey that I talked about, there's a survey item that says district level administrators show concern for the needs of my school. So that's the, the uh, item that we've been using to track district office service. And you'll see in 1718, percentage of teachers and principals that indicated agree or strongly agree was 21%. If we include somewhat agrees, moves up to 48%. But we're not super happy about somewhat agrees. We want people to overwhelmingly uh, be excited about the service they're getting from, from district office. And some of our stories in the videos will show that. So after we got this information, we committed to collecting more feedback and listening to our employees. So in spring of 2017, after we got some of the OU culture and climate survey back, we started school leader and teacher focus groups. That led to launching days of service at the beginning of, of uh, the 17-18 school year. We also really aligned on a, a common definition of service culture at district office. And again, you'll hear about this wow experience that we're really aiming for in a couple minutes. This past spring, we conducted additional school leader and teacher focus groups. We began intensive service culture training at district office, which is still going on. Several employees have gone through that. And we started to ask more questions about district office services from teachers. So I'll share some of those results. And then remove printing click charges. We also revamped teacher onboarding like Paula mentioned. So these questions were in the video and they were the new questions that we started asking this spring to learn more about how our teachers are perceiving district office. And I feel like these show you that lots of teachers believe district office staff care about their concerns. We have a very long way to go though to consistently provide the quality services and supports that our school leaders, teachers, support staff are really craving. So some bright spots to kind of talk about this work. One is the data team. Yeah, I'll pat myself on the back now. Um, the other is, is just kind of like a larger district initiative to really embed this, this desire for wow experiences and aspiring to provide, to go above and beyond when we're working with our school staff. Sean, could I add one thing before you go on? Please. Uh, one of the things we also wanted to do when we um, were learning from the OU Culture Climate Survey that we had much to do is we wanted to ask more questions, but we also wanted to focus on getting more responses. Um, so we were noticing lower response rate with our OU Culture Climate Survey, so we leveraged the opportunity with a teacher survey that all of our teachers um, take. We have very high response rate to embed these questions, additional questions, to help us better understand how people are um, experiencing us. And so specifically, and y'all can correct me if I'm wrong, but on OU, I believe it's about, it's like 700-ish responses compared to 2,100, so three, three times. So. Yes, that's correct. Thank you both. So Holden Mitchell is a data team member who I have the privilege of working with, and he's um, highlighted a bit in this video. So I hope this gives you an idea of what we're aiming for.
try to save teachers time uh, and really teachers shouldn't be searching for data. They um, asked us to con come up with ideas of what we wanted to see on the, on the dashboard. We need to know as much about our, our students as, as we can possibly get, as much information. We just try to enable them and uh, give them easy access then, to that data so that they can uh, yeah, do their job more effectively. I think it's all about listening. If somebody comes to you or sends an e angry email at you or is frustrated with the system that maybe we've built, there's a reason for that. And in the end, ultimately, they're right. So it's very easy to get offended, like, oh, we've worked hard to build this system to try to help you, but you're frustrated with it. Um, so just kind of like removing yourself from the equation and saying, this isn't really, this isn't something that's personal. They're frustrated at this situation. How can we best serve them and build something for them that they, they really love to use? I do feel that they did listen to us because just looking at the dashboard, I see some of the things that I requested. It's very user friendly. Uh, I feel like we got what we asked for as teachers. So just hearing from them and being able to quickly fix those bugs or uh, add whatever data point that they need to do their job, going out to school sites and actually interacting with our users is so important because I feel like in education and technology in general, the biggest mistake people can make is to never actually interact with their users. I like the approach that they gave us because they had us brainstorm and then uh, we they worked with us on prioritizing the information because of course we want a lot of information about our students. By going out and doing uh, trainings at school sites, um, getting feedback through the comments and the dashboards, that's all of our best ideas actually come from the users. And then our chief information and analytics officer, Stephen Fedor, is leading lots of work to uh, really embed this, this desire to create wow experiences for school staff. Service culture is really making sure that individuals have that feeling of being supported each and every day. Um, but it's also about customer experience. I want everyone to feel like I feel. It's going not only above and beyond, but it's doing the completely unexpected in anticipation of we can always be support for individuals. The wow factor is the exclamation point at the end of any um, set of work. This summer, I got the wow experience from the IT department because they're so knowledgeable. They're so, their spirit, they have an excellent spirit. And so that, that reached back to my soul because I want to give others that same excellent spirit that I received. As district office employees, we all have a set of duties that we perform. Um, and often we do that really, really well. We sometimes forget to ask the end user or customer or teacher, family member, principal, what more can I be doing or what could I be doing differently? For our teachers, it was just awesome to walk in your room, your devices are clean, your devices are charged, they're powered on, work orders have been submitted. We were inspired to wow our other team members. I think where we are trending in the right direction is we are beginning to ask how could my work look just a little bit different to provide you a much better experience and so having that really positive experience with every interaction with district office is, is ultimately what service culture is. So I think looking ahead Lots of things that we learned, lots of great things we accomplished, lots of areas that we know we didn't accomplish enough and that we need to continue to improve. And I'm going to hand it off to Dr. Gist to, uh, so we can hear some reflections from her and others who are leading lots of this work. progress in 2017-2018 with significant increases in our graduation rates, improvements in student academic growth in math, 
a significant increase in novice teacher retention and a positive baseline for employees who are engaged and committed to Tulsa schools. We will continue to improve our district office service and our students' proficiency in reading and math. We must also focus heavily on the difference in results for our students of color. We know that we have a lot of work ahead of us, but we remain relentless in our commitment to creating exceptional learning experiences for all students by providing robust supports to our educators, particularly those who are newest to the profession, developing and implementing innovative models for teaching and learning, and designing our district to provide the best supports and services possible to our school leaders, teachers, students, and families. We will also continue working with schools and families to improve student attendance and to develop our young Tulsans as emotionally and socially healthy contributors to our community. The Tulsa Way for Teaching and Learning is a guide and resource for Tulsa educators to um, really articulate the core beliefs, consistent practices um, and resources and structures that all of our Tulsa educators use to um, be effective, excellent teachers. Being a part of that process, being able to um, identify uh, how teachers can have a role in the Tulsa way has been um, really rewarding. One of the things that we heard was we want one place where we can find our key resources. Um, we don't want to have to go in search of resources across a variety of different online locations. Uh, having the Tulsa Way site and having everything in one place, um, that has helped me already. When we talk about what great teaching looks like through the lens of the Tulsa Way for teaching and learning, we think about our teaching and learning cycle. Having a, a strong backbone around planning, teaching, assessing, and adapting. Um, and weaving in relationships, relevance, and rigor to how we do each of those things on a daily basis. It seems more cyclical, you know, that it's gone from, you know, the district asking teachers, and then teachers giving their feedback, and the district going back and saying, well, this is what we've come up with. And then that back and forth is what I think is going to make this really successful in the long run. We are working with 73 core members across 30 elementary schools this year, helping to develop them through an intensive summer program uh, where they received professional development, had practice working with our kiddos in summer school classrooms, and then um, received intensive coaching, which will continue out throughout the course of the year. The core is actually it started as a five-week summer where we were doing extensive teaching as well as learning about what it takes to be a teacher and the skills that we needed in the classroom. By having the teachers there in one place, we were able to work through cycles very quickly, and we saw movement within the teachers in their progression and how they dealt with students and their classroom management and even their lesson planning very quickly. It gives us an opportunity to develop uh, teachers, give them a holistic touch point uh, to help them acclimate to Tulsa Public Schools, and then support them throughout the course of their time with us uh, in the district in a way that ensures that they not only are successful but are staying with, with us in the district. The core sets up standards for them and they have to meet a certain standard to pass the core and the coaches are there to help make sure that they reach that level. So even if we were strong, they were wanting us to be stronger. Nobody thinks high school's right right now. Everybody thinks there are parts that are right, but almost nobody thinks that everything about high school is right for the kids who are in it or for the future that's coming. The model of high school has been the same for about 150 years. I feel like over time, a lot of students have been have adapted to high school, but high school hasn't adapted to us. Now, as our world is changing and the needs of our economy are changing, what we need to be preparing our students for is changing as well. And so this is an opportunity uh, for us to look at what that means. Really, I'm a senior and only need an English credit to graduate this year. So I'm really sitting around like, why am I here for six other classes? Like you said, I could be applying for colleges and even just going to work and maybe after school, you know. So Tulsa Beyond is about this idea that our school communities are the right ones, not to reinvent high school, but like to invent it for the first time 
in the way that it should be. So we've got four schools. Yep. Each of those schools has got a community design team. Throw everything at the wall, see what sticks, and hopefully come up with a model that meets the needs of our students. It's an incredible opportunity for us to show the world what fantastic students we have, what fantastic staff we have, uh, and also to uh, be able to say that we are the best school in the nation, which makes me very proud to be a part of it. What kind of experiences do they want their students to have? Are they going to be in school? Are they going to be out of school? Where are they going to be learning? What are they going to be learning? Where they can say, man, I, I loved my four years there. It was great. Every day we were doing something exciting, and it really prepared me for the success that I'm having now as an adult. This is not a project that's coming from the school district. It's a project that's coming from each local school. And the vision that emerges is going to be theirs. want to have an awesome customer experience. First of all, one of the things we've been doing is really paying attention and listening to what the school sides have been saying. So we made sure that we had principal voice and we had teacher voice. And so it really helped us empathize, to understand, to walk in their shoes, which is part of the service culture definition. Maybe that day the most important thing is to help proctor test. We want to be there for that. Maybe the most important thing that day is to have somebody help clean my classroom. We want to be that. So we want to demonstrate that we are all in. It's creating that communication relationship that's going to make the difference. And so we're just trying to provide some ideas and some experiences and a little bit of a push as we do provide services, as we see people day to day, that we give them an experience that they really appreciate. And we want to make sure that what's needed is provided at that time. We're going to be proactive about it. So don't wait. Right now, what can you do to help? All right, so that actually include, or concludes the State of the District presentation, so I would love to answer. Uh, thank you. Love to answer any questions, and again, I just want to reiterate that we intend on putting even more detailed data up on the website to accompany these slides later this week.